Have you studied the incident involving the USS Farragut? No, with all these deaths and injuries, I've only had a chance to scan the tapes. There are eight or ten hours of record tapes there. Fortunately, I read somewhat faster. Well, folks, happy 25th of December, Christmas Day, for a lot of people listening today. What better way to celebrate Christmas Day in 2020 of all years than to discuss a novel with the festive premise uh, that has the title Spock Must Die? <laughs> Well, everyone, this is uh, the Positively Trek Book Club. I'm Dan Gunther. With me as he is every week is Bruce Gibson. Bruce, how's it going today? I'm doing well. As of this recording, of course, it's not Christmas Day as we record this, but I'm going to be very impressed and humbled if people are listening to us on Christmas Day. I mean, that that's nice that you want to spend the holidays with us and we want to spend them with you. So, But if you don't celebrate Christmas, it's probably not that big of a deal. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely yeah no this was kind of just a fun idea to do this particular novel it's really almost more of a novella as you kind of said before we started recording it's pretty short the editions that we have are 118 pages and uh yeah we figured it would just be a fun little story to talk about for uh this episode which you know it's kind of a special day. I'm sure there's not a lot of people spending their day listening to us, but uh, whenever you listen to this episode, and I hope you do listen to it because I think it's going to be a fun discussion. Yeah, we're going to talk about the first adult novel, the first, sorry, the first original adult novel. So not an adaptation of an ori- of a Star Trek story intended for adult readers, like I said, and it was first published in February of 1970. So this is kind of really if you think about it, the book that you could say kicked off the whole Star Trek original novel thing that, you know, we owe a lot to for, you know, our time on literary treks and our time doing the Positively Trek book club and for just enjoying some great novels over the past however many years from the universe of Star Trek. I do. I do consider this to be the novel that kicked it off for sure. Because like you said, uh, it's the first adult targeted novel and i mean by james blish who also was the author the first author to do adaptations of star trek episodes something i've been wanting to do with you to discuss this on a podcast because of that reason it's the first yeah and as so as you mentioned james blish of course wrote the star trek logs which were the adaptations of the original series episodes And he had been talking about doing kind of an an original novel for quite a while before this came out, apparently. But yeah, finally, February 1970, it was published by Bantam Books. And uh, the the previous original Star Trek stuff outside of the television show we'd gotten before that were the Gold Key comics and the novel Mission to Horatius or Horatius. I'm not never actually heard that said out loud. Yeah, I'm not really sure either. I've never heard it said out loud either. You know what? I you know, I, I don't take pleasure in pointing out errors in anything. Oh. But there is something you got wrong, Dan. So I, and it's rare that you do that so and you may not know this, but Star Trek logs were the adaptations of the animated series by Alan Dean Foster. You are absolutely correct. Yes, uh, I did get that wrong. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, but no, I mean, you know, I think a lot of us forget that and stuff. I just seem to remember that because I think when James Blish did the original series adaptations, I think they were just, what, I think they were just numbered. Star Trek 1, 2, 3, like that, I think. Right. Yeah. And he had, I think by the time this was uh, released, he had done three, Star Trek 1, 2, and 3. Okay. Wow. There you go. And then he did this original one. Yeah. So definitely an interesting place in Star Trek novel history. And uh, yeah, the first one, like we said, targeted towards adults. Those two previous projects had been uh, targeted towards younger readers. It has also, since its first publishing in 1970, been reprinted many, many times. So I'm curious... For you, Bruce, what was the edition that uh, that you read, and when was it published? Ooh, this is going to be exciting. So my edition 
is the 19th edition published in August of 1989. Well, that's very funny because so is mine. <laughs> yeah. 19th printing August, 1989. So I, uh, yeah, really, uh, it, this, it's, it's had some staying power. It's been reprinted many, many times. It has. I remember getting this because I started reading Star Trek novels in 1990. So just a year after this edition was published. And I remember going to Walden bookstores in a mall where the Star Trek section was. And every week I'd go in there and buy a novel. And this, that year, 1990, this is one of the novels I bought one of those weeks. So not only is this the first novel for Star Trek, it's not the first one I've read, but it was read in the first year of me reading Star Trek novels. That's really cool. It's kind of funny to think about where in history that reprinting comes from, too, because by 1989, Pocket Books had been printing Star Trek novels for quite a while. So, you know, it's funny, Bantam had this and a few other books that they were probably kind of relying on a bit to keep their name in there. And uh, yeah, printing this one in 1989 alongside all of the regular pocketbook line that was happening at the time. It'd be interesting to see that on the shelf back then. Yeah, I remember there not being a whole lot of the Bantam books on the shelves. This was one of them. There was the Star Trek New Voyages. I think one and two were on the shelf. I think the, uh, what is it, the Phoenix books i can't even remember the exact oh name. yeah fate, fate of the phoenix yeah faith that was i remember that being on the because i bought while well, i was buying each one <laughs> so i remember it was on the shelf at that time but there wasn't many of them i have a lot of the other bantam books but those were only found in used bookstores so i would say half the band books i have are from used bookstores and the other ones i bought in as new in walden books but yeah the shelf and this is back in the day when you would go into a bookstore and it's like three, maybe even four shelves of Star Trek novels. And the Bantam books just were a small percentage of that. The rest were, like you were saying, all the pocket books from the motion picture, you know, number one, two, three, you know, all the numbered series. I mean, not, you know, there would be some missing from, you know, and I didn't necessarily end up going to that store and buying all the books. I moved to another location and all this stuff. So I was reading things out of order. So, but yeah, yeah it, it was, it was such a glorious time when all those Star Trek books were taking up all these shelves. And then as years went on, I'd go into the stores and I'm like, why is Star Wars taking over the space where Star Trek was? And Star Trek just has one and a half shelves. And then it was like one shelf and then half of a shelf. And even with Star Wars, I don't see the big multiple shelves of Star Wars books like I used to either. Yeah, it does seem to shrink a little bit more every year, and that's that's kind of heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, but there's still a dedicated following out there, as evidenced by, you know, the fact that this podcast exists and, and stuff. So we, we hope to serve those people and, and continue to be those people that consume Star Trek novels for a long, long time. And like I say, I think the existence of that whole part of the Star Trek universe can be kind of traced back to this which is a really cool place in history for it. Yeah, absolutely. And and you and I, who have been reading books and reviewing them on podcasts for as long as we have, it's surprising we haven't touched on any Bantam books until this one. Absolutely. And I, I've never even read this novel until this time around. So it's been on my shelf for ages. I have no idea when I got this or how. It's a former library book. It, it has a little thing in the back. I think somebody gave it to me in a box of stuff or something, but it's sat there for years and years and I've never, ever read it until now. Yay. And now I'm interested to hear what you think of it. Indeed. Well, let's get into that then. So yeah, Spock Must Die. First of all, a compelling title, right? I mean, it's even got a, an exclamation mark at the end. Spock Must Die in big letters on the cover. So, you know, I feel like that would have been a big draw back in the day and kind of still is now for, for picking this up and, and giving it a go. Well, Spock was a very popular character back then. I mean, still is. But I mean, he was really at the height of popularity when this novel came out. And so I can see where they would want to utilize the name Spock in the title. Yeah. And apparently, according to the history of the novel, uh, the, the writer, James Blish, wanted to shock readers by killing a main character. That was kind of his initial. That was like how he started this novel out, which is weird to think about. 
and you know basically discovered that Spock was the the most loved character uh, w- when his wife told him that Spock was her favorite. So that's who he decided to focus on and and to kill off in this novel in kind of a, an odd way. So then the sequel to this novel is The Search for Spock. That was in movie theaters, right? No? <laughs> that must be it. Yeah. <laughs> Not quite. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll get there. We'll we'll get to talking about the end of this novel and sequels in the future, of which there were none, but there were maybe some planned, apparently. But we'll get there because it's an interesting story. So the novel starts out with uh, this debate. And it's kind of a debate that fans of Star Trek have been having for a long time. And it's what I call the trouble with the transporter. So the debate is whether the transporter kills the person who steps through it, whether the person on the other side is actually the same person, whether the soul survives the transit or, you know, what, what about all of that? And of course, this argument is being made by Dr. McCoy, who's asking these questions and Spock and Scotty are kind of on the other side, you know, giving their counter arguments, but it's an interesting question. And one that pops up every once in a while, there's more than one YouTube video out there that somebody has made, you know, is the transporter actually a death machine, (laughs) you know? So it's interesting that the, the kind of premise of this novel is based on that idea. Yeah. It's interesting to read that chapter because it doesn't quite sound like McCoy from the TV shows, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean a little bit, but, but he really goes in depth and, and uses words. Some of them I had to look up to even know what the meanings were. And, you know, he's talking about, you know, there's two universes. There's the universe that is what is inside your head. And then there's kind of like the outside universe, but the outside universe is really a perception of, yourself so it's like this inside outside thing but then the outside is really a reflection of what you witness and how you perceive things from the inside so he kind of goes down that road for a while but then he talks about the whole idea of the molecules being recreated and duplicated and to make yourself when you're using the transporter i really didn't get the connection between the two topics like i i I was waiting for him to say that are we destroying the universe inside of us and creating a new universe? I mean, I, I mean, I guess so, but he didn't really go that specific with that. But I think what he was saying is once we get duplicated or go through the transporter that we still remember everything, but how do we know that things that were in our subconscious or even in our conscious has been erased? Because if it's erased, you wouldn't know it's missing because you don't have any memories of it. It's an interesting argument. It's one of those things that kind of straddles the scientific, you know, physical sciences world and the metaphysical philosophical world. Because, you know, I think Spock would argue that we are no more than the sum of our parts. Like if you took us all apart physically, what what we perceive and see in the universe as ourselves and reassembled it bit by bit, molecule by molecule somewhere else, you're exactly the same. But then there's the argument, well, what about consciousness? What about the soul? What about all of these kind of ephemeral things that we see as, in quote marks, ourselves that, you know, aren't accounted for as a scientific physical thing, which, you know, you can't even define it. So how could you hope to capture it and send it in a data stream to somewhere else, you know, it's just, Mm -hmm. but does it even exist? Is that even a real thing? Or if, you know, as they say, the transporter works here, but other people I've seen argue the transporter doesn't work this way, but the way they say it in the novel is, uh, they basically imprint the essence of your molecules onto different molecules somewhere else and recreate you completely to be the exact same thing that you were on the enterprise. So according to Spock, there's no difference, but I feel like we would say that there is, even though there's no scientific proof, there's no real reason to say that, (laughs) if that makes sense. Well, from McCoy's standpoint, he even said, every time you use the transporter, you're being murdered. 
You know, it's Mm -hmm. just murder after murder that's taking place. And from my standpoint, I would say, well, if you're not necessarily dead, I mean, you're still living, you still have that consciousness. And even though you may be recreated or a duplicate or whatever you want to say that you are after going through the transporter, you're still living life. And maybe your old self is gone, but your new self is picking up where the other one left off. And it's like, if I don't really notice a difference, then who cares? My only concern would be like McCoy saying, like maybe there's things in my memory or things in my head that didn't all come through. But it sounds to me when they discussed this, they said that that would also more likely be impossible because this is like almost a hundred percent recreation. Yeah. And then I, I feel like the, the ultimate argument comes in with, you know, you can't really prove that you're the same person. You might just be a new entity that was totally created and implanted with the memories of this other person who died and you never actually lived that life. But again, there's no way, there's no real way to be able to prove that. So, and, and I love getting into this kind of philosophical uh, discussion because you could say the same thing about going to bed each night. You know, there's a break in consciousness there. How do you know when you wake up in the morning that you're the same entity that went to bed that night? You could be a complete recreation based on the old model with all of those memories implanted and you would never know. And maybe this day is the only day you ever live because tomorrow it'll be someone else who just happens to have your memories. And like, it just, you know, when you start to apply that argument, it, it can't go anywhere. Like this argument really can't go anywhere because you can't prove one way or the other in any, in either of those cases. Right. Which makes this so good because I like bringing up philosophical contests of thought and challenging each other on these things and discussing these things in a Star Trek book. Because to me, that's what Star Trek is. You know, a lot of times people talk about, oh, you know, Star Trek is about, you know, we all get along and this utopia world and all these things and we've accomplished all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but there's there's more to it than that. It's like just these types of conversations to me. I, that's the thing I remember liking and also sometimes not liking about the early books in Bantam and even in Pocket Books is sometimes they really get into the sciences and philosophies a little heavy too much, but I love that. But at the same time, it would sometimes feel like it just bogs it down or gets really confusing <laughs> and it's not as easy to read. Yeah, absolutely. Well, this particular argument, this debate becomes a little bit more real when throughout the court through the course of this novel they have to they, there's basically a war between the federation and the klingons breaks out and they're not sure why the organians haven't stepped in so if you remember the original series episode errand of mercy the organians prevented the federation and the klingons from going to war by using their you know superpowers they're these hyper evolved organisms who are pure energy and they were using their powers to keep them from fighting each other. Well, now the Klingons have broken that treaty and there doesn't seem to be any repercussions and they want to know why. So where the Enterprise is, they're actually kind of behind Klingon space be- with Klingon space between them and the Federation and Organia is very, very far away. So they decide they're going to fly towards Organia and try and figure out what's going on there. But... There's a whole discussion about tachyons. And again, this is getting into that heavy science that you talked about. (laughs) I thought it was really cool to see the word tachyon this early in Star Trek history. So, you know, they've used tachyons in TNG and and all those other series going forward. But this is the first time tachyons get a mention in Star Trek, which is way earlier than I thought. Pretty cool. Yeah, they really get into it and, and, and kind of talk about it and explain it and and how using tachyons, they're able to beam someone from a, from, you know, a really far distance, uh, which made me think of Star Trek 09. Yeah. yeah. You had to think of that, right? <laughs> I had that thought as well. I was like, oh, Scotty's the one that came up with this. <gasps> this is, this is that, you know, following that timeline, basically. I was like, oh yeah, he came up with transport beaming, sort of. <laughs> yes. But that's not what this is. 
Right. No, I mean, this isn't transfer. Really. Yeah, it is different. <laughs> but it did remind me of that because when Star Trek 09 came out, people were like, wait, no, you can't transport somebody transport beaming from, you know, and, you know, it still can sound silly. But in this case, it also sounds silly, <laughs> you know, that you're able to beam <laughs> someone from so far on the other end of Klingon space to a planet all the way on the other side. But, you yeah. know, we come up with the scientific tech, uh, techno babble to make it all sound like it could happen or it, maybe it makes sense with tachyons. Yeah. And, and the way they explain it is a little bit crazy. So they're sending him as, as a tachyon being basically. So yes. made of different particles than a normal person would. And I, I'm, I'm trying to remember, I feel like they kind of gloss over this. They're, they're going to beam him there and then he'll come back and they'll just like get his report and then kill him. <laughs> yeah, it's it's that it's it's the tachyons. So let's say we're going to say Spock. It's a tachyon version of Spock that's being beamed there. But the original Spock stays here with us. Right. So it's like this tachyon version of Spock. That's why they can transport. So they can't necessarily just transport. So it's not like Voyager could transport the crew back to the Alpha Quadrant with the transporter with this technology. They could only beam a ta tachyon version of themselves that sounds like cannot exist very long within our universe and it kind of disintegrates or evolves into its own tachyon universe. Is right. How I okay. That. That's the part I was misremembering. Yeah. It yeah. kind of just eventually dissipates into the other tachyons that make up that realm or something. Right. And then the original stays here. So to McCoy's point, this one's a different situation because Spock would not be re being beamed somewhere. He stays here. So he never dies, but a different version of Spock is made, but a tachyon version that isn't going to stick around or really exist for very right. long. Yeah. Or so we think. So we think. So what happens, of course, is very different. And and conveniently, they have to wall off the transporter pad so no one can see what's happening inside the transporter, <laughs> which is a little bit like, okay, that's convenient. But so they, they energize and they supposedly beam a tachyon version of Spock off to Organia. The doors open and there's two Spocks now indistinguishable apparently from each other. Uh, although we find out later there was something that people should have noticed, but they just happened to not notice at this point, which is honestly probably the biggest problem I had with this novel, which, you know, that's, that's not too bad. Like I actually spoiler alert for my, my opinion of this. I actually really enjoyed this story, but apparently there's a mirrored version of Spock that came back Later in the novel, jumping ahead a little bit, they say that like, oh, his uniform was probably switched around. There was the insignia was on the other side, but in the confusion, none of us noticed that. And I'm like, okay, Spock didn't notice that? Like <laughs> Spock of all people <laughs> didn't notice that his counterpart had the flipped around insignia. But in, in any case, there's now two Spocks who are apparently <laughs> indistinguishable and Kirk can't trust either one of them. <laughs> no well so i think this is funny you know i i love that we have these discussions because you and i are very much alike and in the fact that i also that was probably the biggest problem i had with this novel too because when when kirk goes behind the wall and sees the two spocks he can't tell the difference between the two and they both claim that they really are the real spock and i do believe that they both think that but one of them, I think, then realizes, or maybe does... No, I would say probably the one, duplicate Tachyon one that was supposed to disintegrate in the Tachyon universe didn't, probably did know that he wasn't the original. But anyway, my point is then later in the novel, Scotty is saying, oh, Captain, did you even notice from the badge being the opposite side? Because, yeah, this is a mirror. This isn't... This is a Spock that is an actual mirror image of the original. So the badge would be on the other side of his uniform. And Kirk's like, oh, I didn't even notice. And then by the time I thought to even look, it, it was afterwards. And the, the duplicate Spock would have already started covering his tracks. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was like, you, I was like, wait, 
how can you tell me? Because Kirk wasn't the only one there. When they came off the transport, there's other people there. Didn't anybody notice the other, the Spock's badges on one side? And why didn't the original Spock go, uh, Captain, you notice where his badge is? So <laughs> here we go, Dan. I've worked it out in my head that they beam in, they're behind the wall. The duplicate Spock realizes that he's there notices that his badge is on one side and he flipped the badge before Kirk came and through the wall to see them. And he'd already made the change without the, even the other Spock seeing it and noticing <laughs> he just moved it over. And that's why Kirk's like, I didn't even notice a badge on the other side. Well, of course, because the other Spock moved it. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, throw a bit of a wrench in this because, and, and with apologies to discoveries, depiction of the uniforms as they were at this time if we're going by the original series depiction of the uniforms as you know they would have been the only ones at the time the badge was actually a fabric thing that was sewn into the uniform so <laughs> oh so you think how do you know it was sewed on maybe it just peels off it's just well, like it a could. stick on it could, it could. <laughs> i'm telling you i try to make it just work I, i'm making excuses well, I'll tell you an excuse that uh, maybe could work because <laughs> just tongue in cheek, though, for this one, there are a lot of shots of uh, characters in the original series where they basically just flipped the image to have them looking a different direction or whatever. And you see this often, like you'll notice Kirk's hair is flipped the wrong way. And there are a few times where you can see the badge and it is on the opposite side. Right. So this is a known thing with the Starfleet uniforms. They just occasionally <laughs> flip sides sometimes depending on what's going on. So maybe that's what happened. That's what it is. And they just thought nothing of it. <laughs> Kirk is just so used to seeing people walking around. He's like, I don't know. Badges on one side, then it's on the other. Then I look over at somebody, his hair's part on this side. Next time I look over, his hair's part on the other side. I just see it all the time on the ship. Exactly. It's nothing new. It's, it's uh, just a quirk of how the uniforms and hair apparently work. Yeah. Okay. But then, okay. Go into your point, like, and forget about my excuse, come up with this creative, weird way to make it work. It, yeah, it, it kind of threw me out of it because it's just hard to believe that he wouldn't notice that his badge is on the opposite side because it would have yeah. been, you know? Yeah, it did strike me as kind of an after the fact thing where they're like, oh, okay, they, so he mirrored and blah, blah, blah. And then the writer is probably like, wait, crap, the badge would have been on the wrong side. Well, we'll just say that nobody noticed and whoops, that was an over, you know. Yeah, exactly. It feels like an after the fact thing. But then even that made me think some more too, because if there's a mirror image of a person and, you know, you would notice something a blemish on their face, you know, a mole or something. I mean, there would be some way to look at a, at a picture of Spock. Cause I'm sure they have high resolution pictures at this point in the future. And you could look at one Spock and look at the other and go, Oh wait. Yeah. Look, you see that little mole under his eye there. It's on the right side. The other Spock's it's on the left side. Yeah. There's definitely that. I mean, anytime you see a mirrored image of someone like our faces aren't perfectly symmetrical, anyway even just structure wise and stuff and if it's someone whose face you know really really well i do like think like oh that face looks weird why is that weird uh patrick stewart there's so many times like on dvd cover art or in some book or something for whatever reason they'll mirror his his image just mm -hmm. to have him looking a certain way and i always notice it i same. always notice when it's the wrong way around yeah same here and uh my good old buddy and co-host over at the star wars report riley blanton he uh got married earlier this year and he sent out their uh engagement announcement and I'd seen all the pictures. They had a photographer there when he got engaged. And when I got it in the mail, I kept looking. It was a magnet because it was announcing when the wedding date was going to be. And it was on a refrigerator. And I would look at him like, it's not, it's this picture just something weird about Riley. He just looks a little weird to me. And all of a sudden I looked at it and I realized, I was like, it's a reverse image. And I could tell also because of the buttons a men's shirt, the buttons are, you know, the, is on one side versus the other with the, you know, and, and the hair, the part was on the, cause I took our original picture. I'm like, yep, it's a mirror image. But to your point, I kept looking at every time I'd get a glass of water at the refrigerator, I'd look at it and go, why does Riley look a little off to me? And that's why. <laughs> yeah. 
Somebody should have also checked like Spock's fly. Like which which side is the yeah. button on? <laughs> That's How the name of this up? episode. Spock's fly. <laughs> check Spock's fly. Yeah. <laughs> Spock must die. Check Spock's fly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love it. Okay, I'm writing that down. Sorry. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the whole situation. With the Klingons. So we do eventually get to Organia and kind of find out what's going on there. There's this weird energy field that's kind of enveloped. Actually, before we get there, first of all, did you figure out which Spock was the wrong Spock before they revealed it all? And uh, what, like, if you did, what tipped you off? Well, I remember at one point, Kirk thought that Spock 2 was the fake Spock. I'm just going to call him the fake Spock. Spock 2 was the fake Spock because Spock 2 said, we must kill the other Spock. Mm -hmm. And Kirk was like, I don't think Spock would ever say that. So I kind of believed Kirk, but then I thought, oh, but the author's probably trying to throw us off. So Kirk's probably wrong. So I'm going to say Spock 2 is probably the right one. That's what kind of tipped me off, if if you want to say. What about you? Well, it's funny because like you, I'm always looking for the like tip off and thinking like, oh, they're trying to throw us off and trying, but I kind of had it the other way. So Spock won, he like stuttered or stammered or something at some point. And I was like, well, that's a little weird. And even Kirk was yeah. like, did that happen? Oh, I didn't, maybe I just imagined that, but I'm like, well, it's in the novel. It, it's, it's there for a reason. And he of course locks himself in the lab and, and does all this weird stuff. And I was like, they're trying really hard to make me think that Spock one is the fake Spock. So like on the evidence, I'm like, I'm pretty sure Spock one is the fake Spock, but if the book's trying really hard to tell me that I bet you there'll be some weird twist at the end and it'll be Spock two. And which is funny because that weird twist never comes. So it actually, Oh, it actually just is Spock one. He's (laughs) acting weird and, steals a shuttlecraft and does all this crazy stuff and like oh yeah no he's the bad guy okay cool so i i kind of kept waiting for that twist that never came yeah yeah that's true um yeah but at the same time i'm questioning myself because to your point you know spock one's doing all these strange things i'm like oh well that's probably the fake one oh but the author's trying to throw me out <laughs> like yeah i'm always second exactly this. yeah <laughs> but at the same time you know when spock two was like oh we must kill the other spock wasn't the reason because having two Spocks was going to be very dangerous to the Enterprise? Wasn't it something to that effect? So this book does something a few times that annoys me a little bit because, yeah, he says something to that effect. But then at the end of the novel, Kirk kind of confronts him on it and says, like, you know, I why did you say this? I didn't think it would... I didn't think you would ever say that sort of thing. And he kind of gives the answer that like, oh, because his thought processes were to the opposite of mine, I knew that he was evil and that he would contact the Klingons and put us all in danger, which is why I had to say that, but I couldn't say the reason why I said that and blah, blah, blah. And the book does this a few times where even McCoy is like, I know which Spock's the real Spock. Yes. It's this one, but I can't tell you why yet because of these reasons or, and then Spock, the other, the various Spocks do that too. Like I believe this, but I can't tell you why because of these reasons. And it just feels like they artificially give you suspense. It's like, why aren't you telling me? Well, because of reasons. And then you find out later, it's like, well, he could have told him. <laughs> why <laughs> right. was that? It was just to keep it secret from the audience. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, there's some situations in here that, you know, give the book a little notch down on the on the scale <laughs> of, because of things like that, where you're just like the badge or, oh, there's reasons we just can't tell you why. You're like, you know, OK, <laughs> whatever. Little things like that, but they're minor. Yeah, and, and I agree, too. Like, it sounds like I'm overly annoyed with that sort of stuff, but it was kind of like uh, just like a little Okay, that was weird, but I like I said I'm overall really enjoying this this story for sure. Yeah, me too. I actually didn't remember enjoying this story when I first read it as much as I did this time. Hmm, that's cool. I yeah. may have. I just don't I just don't remember. Yeah, I was a little worried honestly reading this because 
like, because this was my first time and I knew a lot of people really enjoyed it. I worried that like with all of the years of Star Trek history and storytelling that I'd look at it differently and not enjoy it at all. But I actually really did end up enjoying it. So. I thought when we decided to do it, I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be an interesting episode because not to be quite like when we talk about gold key comics, like we've done on literary tricks, but I thought we were going to be having a lot of discussions of like, what the heck was that? And oh my gosh, was that like not in character at all? Like, like I said, it's been what 30 years since I've read this and I don't really remember what I thought of it at the time, but I really thought that's what the conversation was going to be a lot of, and we're not having it. Mm -hmm. Well, in the category of what the heck was that, I guess we can talk a <laughs> bit about when the Enterprise gets to Organia and yeah, they find the planet behind this weird energy field that makes everybody feel really depressed, I guess. And they beam down uh, Spock 2 as he's still being called, even though they're pretty sure by this point he's the real Spock because Spock 1 has stolen a shuttlecraft and <laughs> gone away. And is wearing Kirk's uh, class ring. Right. Yeah. That's how they're distinguishing him. Uh, and you know, McCoy has given his reasons as to why he feels that that's the, the fake Spock and the real Spock is the one they have Spock too. So yeah, they beam down to Organia, Kirk, Spock too, and Scotty, and they find themselves being buffeted by these kind of weird illusions and that sort of thing. So I don't know. What did you make of this part? Because I was enjoying it. It felt star trekky but at the same time i had a hard time kind of following what was going on yeah it, it's a little weird but that's what i loved about it because it was so unique you know it's taking concepts from a tv episode and doing all this weird stuff with it because when they're down the planet organia doesn't look like it did in the show when we saw it and even Kirk's like, you know, this doesn't look right. It looks like it's just like rubble. But then we get all these weird situations and everything is really just an illusion anyway. And it was the first time they moved, uh, the, when they beamed down an errand of mercy. So it made sense to me. So it's like really kind of 70s groovy kind of like I'm a little high on reading this part of the story, man. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like that might have helped a bit because, yeah, it was, it was definitely pretty trippy. But they find out, of course, that Spock 1 is down there as well. And Spock 1, I should say, is the copy Spock, the fake Spock whose mental processes are reversed. So he's all evil and stuff. Uh, and he's he's taken the shuttlecraft there and there's this kind of showdown between the two Spocks. And if I'm reading it right, Spock 2 creates a tornado that takes Spock one up into the, the energy field, or at least that's what Spock one believes is happening because of all the, the illusions happening or something like that. Yeah. It's illusions and things are happening, but it, it's not happening the way that you are visually seeing it. Right. It's, it's kind of because Spock one believes that he has perished in, in this thing he actually has. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. the simple, simplified version of that, yes. <laughs> All right. So that's him taken care of pretty, you know, handily, I think. You know, Spock 2 does the deed, so they do get, like, the, the showdown between the two of them. But this energy field still exists over Organia that the Klingons have placed there, which basically has nullified their ability to affect the outside universe, meaning the Klingons can engage in open warfare. And Scotty has to find a way to take the field down, but he didn't take enough stuff with him because darn it, these uniforms just don't have pockets, <laughs> which I thought was a hilarious little commentary that is there. beautiful, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but thankfully, they have the shuttlecraft that Spock 1 took down there. So... Uh, they can use the equipment aboard it to create this nullifying field that will counteract the Klingons field. Yeah, that started to get a little confusing to me. I remember kind of reading through that twice. And then all of a sudden they're back on the Enterprise. Yeah, because as soon as that field comes down, and it took me a second to realize that's what happened. Like as soon as that field comes down, the Organians have all of their abilities and, and power back. And they're just basically snap their fingers Q-like and... Everyone's back on the Enterprise who needs to be there. And the 
Klingon fleet that was closing in on the Enterprise and about to destroy the ship. Like it was, it was hopeless. Like Sulu was like, launch the recorder buoy. We're going to go down fighting, but we're definitely dying. This fleet, which is led by Koloth from the trouble with Tribbles. I thought that was a nice little touch. Uh, gets stuck in like this time dilation field where they're moving extremely slowly through time. So they're going to be like stuck there for all eternity, basically. Yes. And I'd also remember, uh, wasn't core in there. Core was in this book too. And yeah. Uh, core was like the, there was another fleet cutting off the enterprise from the front led by Admiral core. Yes, who's, Admiral. who's an Admiral now. Uh, that was a nice little addition as well. Yeah. You know, as you're reading this book and, and we're going to get into one part here soon. You know, if you read this book and let's say you're, you're not even aware when it was written or anything like that, and you start reading this and you know, Star Trek, there's going to be things in this book that seem off or isn't consistent with what comes later in Canon. It does kind of feel like it's an alternate reality timeline or whatever, which is kind mm -hmm. of fun too at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. And so, yeah, one of those things is of course these, these particular Klingon ships stuck in that field but the other thing is the Organians appear on the Klingon homeworld and before the Klingon, I forget what they call them, but basically the Klingon high council gets called later and they're told you're not allowed to leave your planet for a thousand years. You broke the treaty. You're stuck here. We are not allowing you to go out into the galaxy anymore. And that's like where they're left at the end of the epi or episode at the end of the novel, which was surprising to me, but then at the same time, thinking it through, like when this was written, there was Star Trek, the original series, and I guess the animated series maybe was, I don't No, it wasn't had, even around yet. Yeah, it wasn't around yet, but there was no like reason to believe that this show that lasted three seasons, actually this was written while the show was on, so it was just some show that was on. There was no reason to think that it would like keep going like even if it just went like five or six seasons or whatever the book just takes place after that and yeah you know who whoever thinks there's going to be a next generation or movies or something like that right it was just kind of like yeah i'm just doing this thing with star trek <laughs> yeah exactly i mean the author's doing this thinking well this is this will be what follows after the three seasons of star trek and I'll end it with the Klingons unable to travel space. And if they ever decide to publish another Star Trek novel, then they'll probably not even use the Klingons or they'll just ignore my novel. They, you know, because they were kind of loose with that stuff back then, more so than they are now. I re that's the one thing that stood out to me. I remembered that when I read this book back in 1990 of a thousand years of barred from space travel and i'm like well i know and because i was very i was always just a casual star trek fan you know but by the time 1990 that's when i became hardcore and i started really digging into all this stuff and even then i knew well i know that's not right because the next generation was already on tv it was in its whatever third or fourth season and uh i think it was just yeah it was going into its fourth season went by the time i read this and of course we've had klingon so i knew that was wrong then but i also remember thinking at the time when i read it well maybe that did happen but then something happened after this novel where the organians reversed their decision well and it's we funny that know. you say that too because apparently there were ideas for sequels to this book that james blish had wanted to write and uh Unfortunately, uh, you know, this was written in 1970 and apparently he was getting sicker and sicker uh, and he passed away in 1975, I believe, of uh, of cancer. Uh, yeah, he he passed away in uh, uh, in 1975 of lung cancer and was getting fairly sick through this period. So uh, those opportunities never came up. He wasn't able to write sequels. But I do wonder you know, he'd said that apparently he wanted to write sequels. I would, I wondered if that situation was going to be dealt with in like a follow-up novel, if something was going to happen where the Klingons managed to evade this and become a threat again, or if this was just going to be allowed to stand in his version of Star Trek going forward. I, you know, I just hope that Viacom CBS is listening right now. And I know you're not, but just in case you are, listen, 
I want to see this adapted to television in animated form. Just a one time special on CBS All Access or Paramount Plus, whatever it's called at the time, it would be Paramount Plus by that time. And then maybe if it's successful, go ahead and do a sequel of it. But I think it would be pretty cool to just pick a few of really some of the real classic Star Trek novels and do an animated adaption for TV. It may not all fit into canon and all that, and maybe so they wouldn't do it, but I I would love to see that. That would be pretty cool. And that said, there are a few dated things in this novel that like, I'd hope they'd kind of leave out a little bit. There was one kind of unfortunate bit that uh, I kind of, I kind of want to read again just to see exactly what they were saying, but about how all of the women on the yeah. enterprise were interested in Spock because of his, uh, his half breed nature and how they could like push away from societal norms regarding different races because I was like, Whoa, okay. What, <laughs> yes. what is this about? <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Cause again, I mean, Spock was very popular at the time and he was kind of a sex symbol for women. And he kind of wrote that in his own way into this book. As a matter of fact, I even went into Trek BBS and I found the thread where they were discussing this novel. It's not very long. It was just like a page and a half or something. And that came up as part of the conversation. But a lot of the things that we're saying were discussed in there. Among that was, um, if you look at the first chapter, the one that we talked about where McCoy's having that conversation of, do you die every time you use the transporter? The chapter title is called McCoy Without Bones. And mm-hmm. throughout this novel, he is never called Bones. He's never referred to as Bones. Kirk, Scotty, and everybody call him Doc, which, again, makes it feel like it's an alternate reality. But I, somebody mentioned in Trek BBS that uh, James Blish said that uh, the editor, he had written it as Bones, and the editor had changed the name to Doc. Yeah, not being familiar with Star Trek right. enough to realize that wasn't a mistake. Yeah, right. So I don't know if the if the title I think the title originally was McCoy without bones because I think it's referring to the fact that McCoy is named Bones and he's beaming and it's whatever. But I think it's funny too because now it almost comes across as saying, well, the McCoy you're going to read in this book is not Bones, he's Doc. So it's the McCoy without bones. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a few things that that like like I said, like we said uh definitely make it a little odd. And and that's one that I noticed when I was doing my research for this as well. Uh, regarding Spock, there's an interesting uh, bit here. Apparently Ellen Cheeseman Meyer reviewed this novel for tour.com in 2012 and uh, had an interesting viewpoint on kind of what we talked about with regards to women finding Spock attractive and the reasons they find him attractive too. Uh, she said uh, that the women aboard the Enterprise sexually desiring Spock was unsettling and that the novel offers sex with Spock, the magical half-breed, as the cure for racism that 23rd century women cannot find anywhere else. Uh, which, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, like that's kind of what it's saying, which is yeah. definitely a little unsettling. Interestingly enough, though, even with that criticism, uh, Ellen Cheeseman Meyer said that it was worth reading as a celebration of the world Star Trek envisioned, however strange that could sometimes be. And I, I really can't think of a better way to kind of summarize this novel. You know, if someone's not read it, I would definitely recommend they do not just for the the interesting place in history of Star Trek novels that it has, but also because it's an interesting story. Like I was genuinely wondering how it was all going to work itself out by the end. So I was definitely carried along by it. Yeah. Same here. I was surprised. I really was. I, I, I didn't remember exactly how I felt about the novel when I had first read it. So rereading it this time, I was like, Oh, this is actually pretty good, you know? And I think because I was surprised by that, I was enjoying it even more because I wasn't expecting it. Well, I guess with all of that said, we were, we've kind of, I guess, given our final thoughts on the novel a little bit, I guess, is there anything that you haven't said about it that you would like to, and maybe a a rating of some kind? No, I think that pretty much covers it. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Now watch, you know, later tonight I'll be like, oh, I wanted to bring up, oh, I should have said whatever. I think that's pretty much it. Oh, there is one thing I do want to say, and this is just a a personal note. When I read this book for the first time, again, this was like my first year as a real Trekkie. I had not seen 
all the original Star Trek series episodes at that point. I'd seen a few here or there. I may have seen Aaron of Mercy one time years earlier, but didn't really remember that much about it or the Organians. So when I read this book, this is one of many times back then where I would read a book like this. And then months later, I'm watching TV. The original series comes on and an episode called Aaron of Mercy comes on and the Organians are there and everything. I'm like, oh, this is this. Wait, this is in that book. That was Spock must die. This, and it, it felt like a prequel to me. Like, you know, it felt like I know the novel followed the episode. But for me, the episode followed the novel. So that's when it was like I was like connecting things between novels and the TV series. So for a lot of people, they see the TV series and then read these novels. But for me, it was the other way around. I was seeing the the TV episodes as if they were playing off the novels. That's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. (laughs) Is there a rating you would give? Oh, yeah. I well, you know, I'm I'm trying to think of a rating that doesn't stomp on any ideas that you have. So I'm going to (laughs) say don't worry about that. I'm going to give your imagination run wild to avoid any kind of thing like that. I'm going to say I'll give this four out of a strong four out of five Organian lights. Wait, there are four lights. (laughs) (laughs) I like it. I like it. Yeah, I I really enjoyed this. I think much more than I expected to. I I kind of went in maybe with a little bit of a low bar, which maybe helped it uh, quite a bit in my enjoyment. So, yeah, I would have to give this four badges that may or may not be reversed depending on which way the character has to look, I guess. See? (laughs) <laughs> it's a good thing I did what I did because I was going to say badges. <laughs> ah, nice. nice. It was either that or multiple Spocks. Hmm, I thought of that. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I, I would wonder if you took the duplicate Spock and sent him through and duplicated him again, what that would like, hmm, would you get an original Spock with the things in the right order? And the original now would just be the evil one. So you'd have two good Spocks and one evil Spock. I I don't know how that works, but I'd be curious to see. Yeah. By the way, I just remember, I don't think we really mentioned it, but when they did beam the Tachyon Spock, he never really got to do what he needed to do on Organia. He bounced back because of that shield around the planet. So it was like Mm -hmm. a mirror that he reflected off of and came back. So we didn't, I don't think we mentioned that, but I did want to throw that in there. Yeah, that's true. It, it, the book, it very quickly happens. And I, yeah, I kind of forgot that that was the mechanism, but yeah, that's why he's a mirror because, and then he can't eat the ship's food because the proteins go a certain way or something, Yes, which, uh, I'd I'd be curious about the actual science behind that. It was interesting. And I was like, I'm just taking this author's word for it, that that makes sense. I don't know (laughs) if it does, but Okay, cool. You know, there really is a different writing style back then, more so than there is now, because a lot of the authors who write Star Trek are fans of Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Back then, there's a lot of authors who were science fiction writers that wrote for Star Trek because that's what they were contracted to do. James Blish didn't even have access to the TV show. He was in the UK, and the original series wasn't even on TV. So he was writing a lot of those adaptations from scripts. And even this novel before actually seeing an episode. So, you know, it, it's a different time. Yeah. And like, like I said at the beginning, he had to find out from his wife that Spock was the most popular character. He didn't even know that. So right. it's interesting. Where today's day, <laughs> any author that's writing Star Trek books knows this stuff inside and out more so than even we probably know. So, yeah, Absolutely. Well, when you're not talking on this show about how much the Star Trek authors know their Star Trek, Bruce, where can we find you? Well, you can find me talking my Star Trek stuff on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex. And uh, I'm occasionally, you know, do some stuff on Instagram at Admiral Rex. And occasionally I'm on the Star Wars Report podcast. And I'm on a recent episode of the 602 Club talking about season two of The Mandalorian. Excellent. And you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Kurtrats, K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on YouTube. YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions is where my channel is there. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this episode. I had a lot of fun. 
Uh, to those of you who are listening to this on Christmas Day, thank you for spending some time with us uh, on, on this day of all days. And happy holidays to everybody out there. I hope you're having a wonderful time. And uh, we will soon be putting 2020 in the rearview mirror. And happy 2021, everyone. So until next time, I'm Dan Gunther. I'll see you then. Stay positive.